Hi, and welcome to Hope Chapel of Greenville, a church based upon four pillars, preaching the authority of God's Word without apology, lifting high the name of Jesus through worship, believing firmly in the power of prayer, and sharing the good news of Jesus with boldness. We hope that today's message is a point of spiritual growth for your life. And now, here is Pastor Will with today's message. Prayer is intriguing. Why do Christians pray? If God has His plans already ready and going to do those, then why do we pray? You ever thought that? Ever asked that question? The answer to that simply is that God has chosen to link His work to our prayers. God knows what He's going to do, but He chooses to link our prayers to His work. That's a truth that you'll find in Scripture that we'll look at today. It's also a truth of church history, and it's a truth of Hope Chapel. Have we not seen God answer prayer? Yes, we have. We sang this morning a song, As we pray, the will of God and man align, and as we pray, the heart of God and man unite. Prayer is an amazing, amazing thing. The struggle is, and all of us are going to be convicted today, the struggle is we don't do it enough, do we? So how does this work? How does God link his work to our prayers? What really happens when we pray? As I mentioned, isn't God's plans already taken care of? God is absolutely sovereign. Does he know what's going to happen tomorrow? Yes. Does he know what is going to happen in a year from now? Yes. Did he know a year ago or two years ago that you would be sitting here this morning listening to this sermon on this day with these people right next to you when this church wasn't even started. Did he know that? Yes, he did. And some of you were praying at that time that God would bring about a church like Hope Chapel. Yet you didn't know that that was going to occur. So how does this all work? If God knows what's going to happen, why does he need us to be able to pray to him, to ask him to do what he already is going to do? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't, right? Why does he do that? Why does he have me do something that he already knows what he's going to do? Why? Because he draws us in so that we can have the privilege and the pleasure of being a part of his work. Remember what Christ prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, let this cup pass from me, right? He said that. And then what was his last phrase to God, his Father? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And was it God's will at that time for Christ to have the cup pass for him? No, it wasn't. And he suffered. But he did so being involved with the hand of God. So what happens, the question I want you to look at today, is what happens when we pray? What are the things that occur, that, uh, that occur because we pray and when we pray? These are real, real questions and they need real answers. So this week, we're going to look at chapter 10 and chapter 11 and see the answers that are there. And I would say up front of this study that God says that, his, that our prayers matter to him. And don't ever let the devil deny that in your life. Sometimes you're going to pray and see. Sometimes you're going to pray and it's going to seem like the heavens are brass, doesn't it? And that your prayers are going nowhere. Is that true? Has that ever happened to you? And you're praying and you don't even know if God's listening to you. And the evil one's right on your shoulder. I heard one time a man say that the devil fears when we pray. It doesn't matter when we preach, but when we pray, the devil fears. No, the devil doesn't fear. He sits right next to us and he starts whispering in our ears. You got this to do. You got that to do. God's not listening to you. Remember the sin that you did? God's not hearing you. But I want to tell you this morning on the authority of the Word of God that God does listen to your prayers. And God does align your heart with His as we pray. And that God unites our heart and our soul with Him as we pray. We are the ones who change in prayer. You've heard the phrase, prayer changes things. Somebody ought to make a plaque that says, prayer changes me. Because that's what happens. So, I want to remind you, if you'll take your Bible and turn back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we have the outline of the Scriptures as far as the book of Acts is concerned. He says to his disciples, you're going to be witnesses unto me 
Here, near, and far. It's basically what he says. Here is Jerusalem, near is Judea and Samaria, and far is the uttermost parts of the world. He said, you're going to do that. So that simply means for us in chapters 1 to 7, he is having the gospel presented to the Jews in Jerusalem. You'll be witnesses to me, he says to the disciples. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 8 on through chapter 12, he starts to show that he wants the witness, God wants the witness to go into the Judea and Samaria. That's kind of like the state or what we would call our nation near that area, okay? And then he says in chapter 13, I want you to go into the uttermost parts of the world. That means everywhere, and the 12 disciples did that. And all of them, save one, which is John, all of them were martyred for the faith, including Paul. God said, I want my witness out there, but I want it based upon the prayer. And so the, the new church that started, were in, uh, they were having meetings and together praying together. This month for Hope Chapel is our prayer month, one of the prayer months of this year. And it matters a lot to us that we pray. It matters to us that we ignite within our heart a desire to seek after the Lord. Now the reason that I say prayer is the basis of everything we're looking at today, I want you to look at chapter 1 and verse 2 and see this. Because prayer is all through this passage of Scripture. It says that Cornelius prayed to God always. Pardon, just a moment. Cornelius is not a Christian at this point. He does not know God. And yet it says in verse 4 that we read that God hears the prayers. In verse 4, he is told by the angel, your prayers come up to a memorial before God. Look at verse 9. Peter comes on the scene, and Peter went out into the housetop to pray. So not only is Cornelius praying, but Peter is praying. Turn from there to verse 30, and it says, Cornelius re uh, relating the story, says, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man came and stood before me in verse 31. And he said, Cornelius, your prayers have, have been heard. So he's reiterating what takes place. And look in chapter 11 and verse, uh, and verse 5. He is explaining what happened. And, and Peter says, I was in the city of Joppa praying. Now, brothers and sisters know this. Prayer is the basis of many of things that God does. And it's the basis of what God's going to do in your life. But you and I have to be reminded that prayer is something that is just not an option for the Christian. Prayer is the very core, it's the very atmosphere, it is the very soul of a Christian before his God. And if we are not praying, we are not enjoying all of the stuff that God has for us. Does it make sense? So you ask yourself this morning this simple question, am I praying as God would have me pray? Now let me balance that by saying this, can you pray too much? I got some noses and I've got some yeses. Yes, you can pray too much. What do I mean by that? There are some times where God says to individuals in, in the Bible, what are you praying for? Get up. Go. Do what I told you to do. See, prayer is not a solution to obedience. When God says do this, he doesn't want you praying. He says what? Go do it. Okay? Does that make sense? So we want to be able to pray, but we want to make sure that we don't use prayer as an excuse, but I think we're much, many of us are far away from that. We don't want to make prayer something that we can use as an excuse not to obey. So there are eight things that I'm going to give you this morning in this passage of Scripture. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to have to really work to get through all of this, all right? So stay with me, all right? If you're right in the middle of the sermon, I'm going too fast, just take your hands and go like that, all right? And that means I'm just going way too fast, all right? And I'll not look at that and just keep on preaching, okay? Eight things that I want you to see. When we pray, what happens? When we pray, what happens? Number one is this. God draws man to himself. And you'll find that in verses 1 to 8. It says, as we read this morning, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was a centurion, and a centurion was a captain of 100 individuals, which was part of a cohort, which was 600 soldiers, and there were six centurions, which was a part of a legion, which had 6,000 individuals. So he is the backbone, he's one of the backbones of the Roman army. The whole nation of Rome depended upon their centurions to keep the order and to keep structure within the army. So this guy is a leader. This guy is wealthy because usually centurions were paid 25 times more than the regular soldier. So he's a leader, he's a soldier, he's respected, but that's all positioned, all right? Let's look at his character. There are four things that's noted in verse 2 and 3 that it says about his character. Number one, he's devout, meaning simply religious. 
Second thing is that he fears God. What's that mean? He has respect for that there is a God. He can be a deist. I know that there is a God, all right? Third thing, it says that he gave alms or he gave gifts. He was a generous man. Fourth thing, it says there that he prayed to God how many times? Constantly. He prayed to God always. And this guy didn't know the Lord. It's kind of convicting, isn't it? But how many people do you and I know that are very, very, very religious, more religious than us? I have friends of mine, they're in another religion. You ever heard of the Mormonism? Okay. You want to talk about religious people? Very, very religious. But that didn't mean he was saved. But what's transpiring in verses 1 to 8 is that God is starting to draw this man to himself. And an angel shows up, and that's really drawing, all right? That, I mean, when an angel shows up, you know you're being drawn, okay? So an angel shows up and says, hey, your, your prayers and your, your giving has come before the Lord. So this is what I want you to do. Go send some people to find, find Peter. The point of that is this. When a man prays, God starts to draw him to himself. When I pray, when you pray, God is in the process of drawing you to himself. I want you to get to that because that's extremely important because when we don't pray, what happens? We're not drawn to the Heavenly Father. Every time you pray, brother and sister, not only are you drawn, but those around you that you're praying for are drawn. Second thing I want you to look at that happens when, when we pray. God prepares souls for ministry. Not only does God hear all the prayers, but God prepares the souls when they pray. A couple of weeks ago, as I've mentioned to you, I was with about four or five guys here early in the morning. You can always tell the individuals that are morning people, all right? How many in here are morning people? Can I see your hands? Where you, come on, don't, don't be shy. Raise those babies up, all right? See, there are the godly people in this church, all right? But I was here this, at five o'clock on, on Friday morning and I was praying. We were specifically praying for someone that we didn't know. I have yet to meet the individual that I prayed for. And yet I saw God begin a burden upon the men that later on in the day, that later on in the day resulted in tears and pleadings with God. I watched God take my heart and rip it for somebody I didn't even know and don't know to this day. And there was pain and there was sorrow because there's always a price to pay when you're praying for the souls of men. You know why? Because the evil one doesn't want it to happen. But what I found out a little bit later is that God opened her heart, Julie, and now she is in Florida having professed the name of Jesus Christ and we are a part of that. So in, in praise to God, would you please clap with me for that, all right? All right. How many prayed before two weeks ago that God would bring salvations to our church? Put your paw up, all right? Come on, keep it up there, keep it up. Did God answer that prayer? Say amen. Amen, amen. amen. okay. Did God answer that prayer with more than just one? Yes. Did he, did he answer that prayer with more than just two? Yes, yes. God has brought salvation to the church, but you know what? All it does ought to do is make us more thirsty. Amen? So don't give up praying, and in this month, pray that God would continue to bring salvation to this church. But the second thing I want you to look is that God prepares his soul for ministry. What am I talking about? In verses 9 to 16, you'll find Peter. What does he do? In verse 9, it says, the next day, and the next day, Peter went up to the housetop to pray. As they, as they went on their journey, Peter went up to the housetop to pray. Peter was in Joppa, having just raised Dorcas from the dead. Pretty good deal, right? Um, lots of people get saved. He's there. Salvation is occurring. Many, many individual crusades happening, revivals happening, all right? And so there's Peter, and he goes up to pray. It'd be a good thing to do, all right? So Peter goes up to the, house, uh, to the housetop. It's like a balcony type thing. And he begins to pray, it's noon, all right? And all of a sudden, God comes and says, let me teach you something. I just want to ask you this question. How many things have you missed from God because you haven't been praying? I hope we don't learn that in heaven. Because there will be a lot of tears, right? It says in the scriptures that, that God wipes away those tears. 
How many things in our life, brother and sisters, have we missed because we're just lazy and don't pray? Not Peter. But God wanted to prepare, and this is what I want you to get out of what happens with Peter. God wanted to prepare Peter for ministry. You see, Peter had only been talking to Jews and, and uh, Samaritans, half-breeds. That's all the farther he would go. So God said to, said to them, I'm, I've got this for the whole world, Acts 1.8. So they know that, but what do they think? The whole world, who is he talking about? All the Jews in the whole world, right? So he says, you're going to be in Jerusalem, and you're going to be Judea and Samaria, and then you're going to be the other parts of the world. And, and Peter is okay with this, these two things, right? That one over there, I'm not too sure. And God says, I want to teach you a lesson. And here's the point, guys. As you pray, as you pray, God's going to prepare you for more ministry. As you pray, as Hope Chapel prays, God's going to prepare this church for ministry. And get this, it's not going to be always comfortable. We'll see that in just a moment. So here's Peter, and look what transpires with him. He's, he, comes in, he goes into a trance, and all of a sudden, there's this sheet, and God's teaching him a lesson, and in this sheet are all kinds of animals, clean and unclean, common and uncommon. They were told in the Old Testament they couldn't eat uncommon, uncommon animals. They were, uh, in God's mind, unclean, and so they said, okay, we're not going to eat those. And so they all come down into the sheet, and God says, look what he says to him in verse 13. And a voice said to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Uh-oh, we got a problem. Why? That goes against my theology. Uh, get this application, okay? Oftentimes, God is going to take us to places that we are not comfortable in, but he wants to prepare us for a broader ministry, okay? And it may go against our theology. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about the essential theology, right? I'm talking about the non-essential theology. Okay? And so Peter responds with, not so, Lord. That's an amazing statement. <laughs> okay? Who's he talking to? What's Lord there? Okay? Who's he talking to? God? Imagine the strength of this guy. I mean, if God came to you and said, Julie, I want you to go there. I want you to go to Starbucks. They'd never say that. Okay? Um, but let's say God said to you, um, I want you to go to some park because I want to I want to uh, share with you a person that you're to um, uh, lead to the Lord. Okay, and you say not so, Lord. What does Tom say if he knows what Julie just said to the Lord? Yeah, he's moving away. All right, okay. But Peter says not so, Lord. He said I've never done that. What is he saying? I'm self righteous, right? I've never done that. I'm not going to do that. Okay, you get that. And the Lord said this. Look at the phrase in verse 15. The Lord spoke to him and said again the second time, what God has cleansed you must not call common. It's done three times. You get it, Peter? One time, get it, Peter? Second time, get it, Peter? Third time? All right, you got this, Peter? What I'm trying to get at is that God was preparing Peter because we know, if you read this passage or knows this passage, we know that God has a broader ministry. Peter does not know that. So God is making him uncomfortable. Listen to me carefully. If you're going to have a broader ministry in your life, if you are going to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you will be uncomfortable. It can happen no other way. God doesn't give us some um, Diet Coke, sit us in a couch and say, you know what, I'm going to make you a godly Christian. You don't have to do anything. I'm just going to, the wolf will dust on you and you're just going to become a god and that's not going to happen that way. You're going to hurt. And my heart aches for many of you who are in this setting and every single day you are in pain because that's God's design for your life. You're in chronic pain and God, why are you doing this to me? Because God has got a broader ministry for you. Some of you are struggling with your, with your um, boss and your job is not going well and he just doesn't understand me and it's a struggle. It's not comfortable. What is God doing? Making you have a broader ministry. God may take you to a place that you don't want to go because he wants a broader ministry out of your life. Is it fun all the time? No. Would you rather stay here? Yes. This is the time to say yes, brother. Okay. okay. You want to stay here? Yes. Yes, you do. God says no. I got you moving because God is preparing you for a broader ministry. Number three, I want you to look at this. Number three, God sends us into the harvest. God sends us into the harvest. And by the way, just a side note here. What was God working on Peter with? Was Peter prejudiced? Was he? Sure, he hated Gentiles. They weren't a part of the deal. 
God, you told us they're, they're out. We're not having anything to do with them. God said, no, 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 no. We're changing things here. Peter's got a problem with that. Let me just pause this and write this down in your notes, this statement. Prejudice is unacceptable in the Christian's life. Okay? Prejudice is unacceptable in the Christian's life. You know what that means? Racially. Racially, it means ethnically, prejudice for a person's race, prejudice for a person's ethnic background, it's unacceptable for us. Why? What does John 3.16 say? God so loved part of the world, right? Put that Greek word in there, God loved part of the world, and I'm part of that world, okay? I, I, right? No, God says I love all. Does God love the individuals who will go to hell? Yes, he does. God loves everything he creates. So that's not a part of the deal here, okay? And I pray God just overloads this white collar, pardon me if I'm offending you, white Caucasian church with all kinds of different individuals. Poor, uneducated, different race, individuals that have not the education of eighth, eighth grade. I hope they come and I hope they sit in these black chairs and I hope they make us feel uncomfortable. Why? Because God's opening the door for a broader ministry. Amen? So be prepared to be uncomfortable with this. Be prepared to be uncomfortable because they are coming. All right? They are coming. Why? Because God knows your hearts that you want to know as manifest presence. And God is pleased with that. I see hearts every week that they come here and God, I just want to sense your presence this morning. I just want to know that you're here and in my life. Okay? When that happens, what took place with Peter is that God sends us into the harvest. That's the third thing I want you to see. God send us into the harvest. Look at verse 17. It says, now while Peter wondered on these things, now I want you to notice the timing and the providence of all of this. Peter was in Joppa and that's a day's uh, travel away. And he calls Peter to pray the day after he talked to Cornelius. And Cornelius was told by God to do what? Send people to Joppa, right? So he sends people to Joppa, and when they show up, what's Peter doing? He's praying. What I want you to see is God's providential work in this. God orchestrates time. God knows what's going to happen. He's got it all planned out. And as we pray, God begins to send us into the harvest. Do not, I beg you as brother and sister, do not go into the harvest without God sending you there. And are there times where God says, I don't want you to throw the seed out? Anybody know a verse that says, don't throw the seed out before swine? What's that verse? What does it say? Don't cast your, what's that mean? Any individual who disdains God, doesn't want anything to do with God, you don't share the gospel with them. Why? Because all they do will turn around and trample on it and dishonor the gospel. Yeah. God didn't like that. Okay. So what happens? God sends us into the harvest by providentially working out all of the time. All right. He sends us into the harvest through our prayers. Christ told us, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send you into the harvest. Because the laborers are what? Yeah, the laborers are what? Few. We don't want to be a part of that, do we? We want to be sent into the, the harvest. God sends us to the harvest through our prayers. And so look in verse 20, what happens with them. God, God says, arise, go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter was in the classroom. He didn't fully understand what was going on, but God asked him to do this. Simply obey. Brothers, sisters, listen to me. There will come times in your life where God, you know, God says, I want you to do this, and you don't quite understand it. Don't expect to before you obey. God simply wants your obedience. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you tell your children, I want you to do this, and do they always have a clue about why you're telling them to do it? Any child in here understands totally why their parent does any, everything to them. No. 
Sometimes my father and my mother would tell me to do something and that made no sense. You know what? They're the dad and mom. I'm not. And some of the children who are here and I love you dearly can get that a little bit mixed up. All right? Amen, parents? Ooh, you must have great kids. I would have said really strong amen, all right? Sometimes the kids think they know better than the parents. Nathaniel, you think that? Now's the time to say no if you want lunch, okay? <laughs> but in the same way, God will call you and me to himself and say, I want you to do this and it doesn't make sense to you. That's good and that's right because I want you to have faith. Do you know all the time why God's taking you different locations? No, you just know this is what God wants. I don't know all of the things that will happen. Remember the song, Trust and Obey? For there's no other, no other way. To be happy in Jesus, trust and obey. Good, good songs, amen? I would sing it, but we'd all get in trouble. My wife would rebuke me when I'd go home and say, don't ever, ever, ever sing in public again, please, okay? <laughs> trust and obey, there's no, uh, I'm not gonna sing it, okay? <laughs> Trust and obey, that's what God wants. And that's what, when that occurs, God sends us into the harvest, keep moving, okay? Number four is this, look in verse 34, what transpires. So he goes with those individuals, starting in verse 24. He comes up and he meets Cornelius. Cornelius tells him what's taking place in his life. He doesn't know any of that. Verse 30, Cornelius says, four days I was fasting, Four days ago, I was fasting unto this hour, and uh, at the ninth hour, I prayed. In the house, a man stood before me. You've been heard, sin to find Peter. Look what he says now. So I sent to you in verse 34 immediately, and, y and you have done well to come. <laughs> I like that. Peter, the apostle, right? The number one apostle, the head of the body. You've done well. You know, that's a leader, right? You did good, Peter. You did good, all right? So what happens with Peter? I want you to look in verse 34 because this is where it begins. God reveals truth. Peter opened his mouth and he said, are you guys hot in here? Okay, I'm burning up. Uh, there's one right over there. Turn that up and Jim, you can turn that down, that over in the... Uh, thank you, brother. All right. Peter opened his mouth and he said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. God revealed truth to him. And here's the truth that God taught to Peter that no man is out of the call no man is out of God's love for prayer and for salvation um, you're in Acts turn to the book immediately to your left Romans chapter 3 I want you to see why the uh, I mean to immediately to your right I want you to see Acts chapter 3 excuse me Romans chapter 3 Romans chapter 3 Romans 3, Romans 3, Romans 3. I want you to see the, jo the Jews were told, the Jews were told that they were not to have anything to do with the Gentiles because God was going to call them unto himself. And so they thought by that that we're better than they are. They took that to mean that God hated Gentiles and loved the Jews because of something in them wrong. God loves the world according to John as I mentioned. I want you to get this. There is no salvation partiality God did not save Mark because he's such a great guy. Now Mark's a great guy, but God didn't save him because of that. God saved him because God is good, amen? Chapter three, look what happens. What advantage then has the Jew or what profit is circumcision much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Back to Acts chapter 10. What Paul was saying to them is, listen, God used you to bring salvation to the world. God used you to bring Jesus into the world. Jesus was a Jew. God used them for the oracles of the Bible that we have. That's what the blessing of the Jews was, not for them to say to themselves, we're wonderful and everybody else is bad. Now we live in a nation, and I wanna apply this a little bit, we live in a nation that does not allow religious discrimination or discrimination of any kind, true? We've gone a little bit haywire on that, but the desire is good. We want everybody to be equal. The problem is that mankind living together will never be equal. I am not a smart individual. I did not get A's in college, right? I got C's. 
Sorry, you got a dumb pastor, all right? <laughs> there are guys who got straight A's when they were in college, all right? I'm not one of those guys. Learning about poetry and all of that stuff just really didn't cork me, all right? Um, but God uses all kinds of people. And I've got children who are smarter than their dad. I'm not going to tell you which ones. And they're not here this morning. No, my children are here this morning. We're in trouble, okay? Um, they're smarter than their dad. They got more brain power. They got grape, all right? Is that fair? Write this down. God is not fair. Write it down. God is not fair. What's fair mean? Everybody's got the same stuff from God, right? Is that true? Some of you are tall, and the better ones are short. And all God's children said? Amen. Amen. Okay. There you go, buddy. There we go, buddy. Okay. There are things that a short guy can do that a tall guy can't do. There are, there are short, there are things that certain individuals that don't have the intellect of other individuals can do that other people cannot do. Got that? All right. There are individuals who, just because of their position in life, their parents have got a lot of, they're financially sound. They can do certain things that other people can't do. Who is the one that determines all that? God does. God is the one who said, okay, Paul, my brother, you got a lot. Will, we'll just kind of give you a little bit there. It'll be fun to watch, okay? Go ahead, take that test, Will. Don't pray, because it ain't going to happen, all right? See? <laughs> but God, God is the one who does it. God is not fair. Now write this. God is just. God is just. We got multiple engineers in this place. They think different. They're intelligent, most of them. <laughs> I mean, you can get, you, you, engineers can tell me, you can get through that stuff, all right? Fake it and all of that. And you build buildings that crush, but not our three, not our three engineers. They know what they're doing, okay? The, the point that I'm saying there is not everybody can be an engineer. The reason I'm saying that is when it says here God is not, has no partiality in him. That doesn't mean that God is absolutely fair. What it means is God gives the offer to everybody. What's the phrase? Whosoever will, whosoever will may come. Is that true? Sure, it's true. So when it comes to truth, or when it comes to with uh, the gospel, God has no partiality with man. Now let's keep moving on. We've got to get to the next point, all right? God reveals truth. God reveals truth. But then look what happens, and this is the one I want to kind of sit down on and really get, I want you to get, okay? So I'm going to read a little bit. Peter opened his mouth. Look in verse 36. And the word which God sent, preaching peace. Verse 37. That word you know which was proclaimed, which John preached, Verse 39, and we are witnesses, 41, but to witness this, he says, not to all people, but to witness the witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who were with him after he arose from the dead. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach and witness, 43, to him all the prophets witness. This is what I want you to get. God anoints preaching and witnessing. When we pray, God anoints preaching and witnessing. Now this is a burden on my heart because this is what I do. This is the, the, the sum and total of what a pastor does. He not only loves God, but he loves man. But I want to teach you something. And I want your heart to be with me as I, because this is extremely, extremely, extremely important for us as Hope Chapel, okay? Because God is doing a work in this church. He is changing this church. He is broadening this church. I have people who are, that are in other states that say, I want to come down and be a part of this church. Guy just found out about what we're doing and he says, you know what, in a couple of years when I, when I graduate from college, I want to come down and be a church planter of hope chapel somewhere i'm not doing that okay i have nothing to do with that god is doing that 
But I want to teach you something that is in the very core of who we are as Hope Chapel. The first pillar is proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology. The authority of God's Word. If we as a church ever, whether I'm here or whether we're gone, if ever this church has a weak pulpit, we're in trouble. There are things that a pastor, that a preacher has to say that are uncomfortable. And that which makes him have that ability to do that is what we call unction. Okay, write that word down because that's extremely important. You may not know what unction is, U-N-C-T-I-O-N. Unction, what is it? The best way to describe it to you is to read to you this this, uh, quotation. Listen carefully. Unction is that indescribable gift of the Holy Spirit on a man preaching the truth which consumes and controls him in such a way that the blazing holy God of eternity is revealed before the congregation so that they are rebuked for their sin encouraged in their holiness, enlightened in their minds, warmed in their hearts, and separated unto their God from the world, flesh, and devil. It is absolutely undeniable in its impact for godliness as it inspires the preacher's mind, empowers his heart, brings unashamed boldness to his logic, his passion, and his delivery. It is obtained only by the prayers, get this, it is obtained only by the prayers tears and pleadings of his soul and of those to whom he preaches it is God's singular blessing to his children and to a suffering and dark and damned world it's the very thing that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus said remember when Jesus explained the scriptures to him what did they say later get this get this get this what did they say later did not our hearts burn as he opened the scriptures to us? Every Sunday, my goal is to be an instrument of the Holy God so that your hearts would burn with the Word of God. And it's not going to happen by my prayers alone. Remember the phrase, it is not obtained by his prayers or his tears, or his, but of those to whom he will preach. So I'm going to apply that in this way. I'm going to ask you, as people in this church who have been given the responsibility and the stewardship of this church, to pray on a daily basis that God would grant unction to the preaching of his word at Hope Chapel. Because it's within your prayer time that God takes this time and make it special. Brothers and sisters, I can, I can read commentaries up here and I can give you all the truth in the world. And I could tell you exactly how each word in the Greek, how, what it means and how it's parsed and how it how interacts with the other. But if God doesn't come in and take that word and pr- apply it into your life, that makes you change and you start to realize that I am in sin, that I'm allowing sin into my life, that I need the encouragement of God, that the Holy One of Israel comes into my life and says, you are mine, I will take you, I will deal with you as I please. If the Spirit of God does not anoint my preaching, you are the ones that hurt. Do you get that? So it only blesses you when you pray that God would anoint and give unction to my words. I am a human being. I am a frail, fallible human being. And it's God's work in your heart that draws you into prayer and says to God, please grant unction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit into the life of our pastor. And I will promise you as you do that and you give yourselves over to that, God will come in upon this church and in our worship as a mighty rushing wind comes to our souls. Our worship will be different. Our preaching will be different. Our lives will be different. But it comes when the word of God is preached in such a way that your lives are impacted and the world that is in darkness out there not knowing who God is is brought to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is on your shoulders. And regardless of where God takes us and whatever facility we move to, if that doesn't continue to be a central aspect of our lives, 
what transpires is that the whole wealth that God and the treasures that God can bring and pour out on His people are not done. They're held back. God withholds when we are silent in prayer. Your heart on every day, your heart needs to be, God, please bring your spirit into our church. Today, it's Monday, but God, in six days, we're going to gather together. Come and be with your people. Let them enjoy your presence. Bring heaven down. Remember the song we sang a couple of weekends, a week, weeks ago? Open the heavens. See, We need to be done with dead churches. We need to be done with dead sermons and dead prayers and dead worship. We've got to be done with that and say, God, we want to know your face. We, we've, we've, we've listened to sermons and, and we've known about you for decades but we want to know your face. Because in so doing that, you will be changed and the people that you know will be changed because they'll see that change. Just as it happened with Callie and Julie. I give that as an example to you. So I'm gonna ask you to pray on a regular basis whenever God brings Hope Chapel to your mind and you're driving down the road or you're in your prayer time, God brings Hope Chapel to mind pray that God would grant unction upon your pastor so that you may know and understand the word of God because you know what sometimes God's going to make me say stuff that you don't like to hear have you always enjoyed everything I've said if you have if you have then he ain't listening excuse me you're not listening okay because it's not easy God anoint, when we pray, God anoints preaching and your witness as you go out into the other places. Number six, God, when we pray, God gives his manifest presence from 44 and 48. I love this passage, I'm gonna read it. And when Peter was still speaking, he's preaching to these guys. This This is really, this is way cool, okay? This is excellent, all right? I know cool is an old word, all right? But I'm an old person, all right? Some of you, I sent the word, somebody told me, this is gonna happen, I said cool, and they said, what? Well, it's better than sick. Well, that's really sick, all right? Sick means sick. It means your health, all right? What are we going to do? All right. Verse 44, when Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were, heard the word, and those of the circumcision were, uh, who believed were astonished. Look what God is doing. As, mighty, as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. This is not supposed to happen. For they heard them speak with tongues, and here's the key, they magnified God. When we pray, God gives his manifest presence. When we pray, God gives his manifest presence. And then Peter says, can anyone forbid water to those? Should they not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? Brothers and sisters, listen carefully. If you know the Lord, if you've, been, if you've professed the name of God and your heart has changed, you haven't been baptized, listen carefully, that is a matter of obedience. I don't feel like it. It's a matter of obedience. Okay? It's important that you take that upon yourself. God didn't suggest that. God said when you become a Christian, you're baptized. You know why? Because it's a declaration. It's a public declaration of what God has done in my life. Okay. And he commanded them, verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. When we pray, God gives his manifest presence. I yearn, as I've mentioned, I yearn for the presence of God on, on Sunday mornings. Now, now let me just, let me pause here and say this. God's manifest presence is not always a bombshell. I saw it last week in the tears of a little girl was simply wanting to know what God wanted in her life. I saw it in the tears of individuals as they worshiped the Lord. It's the presence of God. It's not always a bombshell. But brothers and sisters, you know what? I want the bombshell. (laughs) Right? Don't you? I mean, I, I love the tears and I love the pleading and I love the changing in heart, but I just want to see God just come in and move us. So when we walk out of here, we're different people. Do you not want... Uh, Psalms 90 
Father, let me see you work again. Let me see your glory, it says in that verse. And let, my, let me see you work again and let my children see your glory. Dads, moms, don't you want your kids to see your glory, to see God's glory? Yeah. Look in verse 46. We'll see number seven. God transforms people. God transforms people. That's what we want. You come here on Sunday morning, there's one thing that I want you to see, and that's God. And listen carefully to me. You can write this down in your notes. When I see God, I will be changed. So seek him. When these individuals saw the works, the mighty works of God, they were changed. Now I'm gonna pause here and say this to you, and it may be a little bit bothersome of you, but I want you to listen carefully. I believe whenever the church of God humbles itself and trembles at God's word and God's pastor or preacher has the unction of God in his life, I believe there are works special signs and wonders. Now, I'm not talking about all of the weird stuff going on. I'm just saying that God validates his word. And the greatest sign and wonder is salvation. If salvations do not occur in our church, we're unhealthy and something is wrong. I want to see these these chairs are going to fill up, but I'd love to see them fill up with brand new Christians. Amen? Amen? That's what I want. And that comes, it comes by the Spirit of God. Because it says in 1 Corinthians, Paul was saying when the unbeliever comes into your midst and he sees that God is, he falls down on his face and he makes this statement, behold, surely the Lord God is with you. Don't we want that? When we pray, God transforms people. When we pray, God transforms people. And I want you to know, I hear it on Friday mornings right here. And men, let me encourage you for the last two Fridays on, uh, of this month, sacrifice and come out, five o'clock. I know some of you may be traveling from half an hour, 45 minutes away. Come, be with us for the last two. And I don't want to put that guilt trip on. We don't do guilt trip here in this church, all right? If you can make it on a regular basis, great. If you can't, that's good. Make it another time, okay? It's not a guilt basis. I'd love to meet with you. We'd all love to meet with you. We'd love to have this whole section here filled out with guys, all right? Two, two weeks, last two Fridays. But I, I, have, I have knelt down with men here weeping over you who are not here. I have heard prayers for individuals in this church that have chronic illness and they pray and they plead and they ask God, please give them just a good day today. I've heard them pray for your financial situations that you're struggling through. I've heard them pray for parents with their children. I've heard them pray that God would answer their prayer about winning someone to the Lord. I hear them here at this place, right here, praying for you, for college kids that are, I hear them pray for you. That's what it means. And what I'm saying is God does that. And as we pray here, God changes us. God transforms, when we pray, God transforms his people. And the last thing is simply this in chapter 11, verses one to 18. God quiets unrest and brings peace. It says in verse two, those of the circumcision contended with them. In other words, they weren't very, very happy with what Peter did. Church in Jerusalem had some real problems. They didn't like Gentiles. They didn't like you and me. They didn't believe that you could become a Christian unless, first of all, you proselyted to the Jewish religion. They wanted you to become a Jew and then you could become a Christian. God said that's not the way it's gonna be. And so when he got back to Jerusalem after seeing this great and wonderful thing happen and the works of God and the, and the falling down of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, he looks at him, he says, so you gonna argue with God about this? Do you wanna do that? I don't. I don't wanna get in a debate with God. I don't wanna get in an argument with God. You know why? There's one thing about when you get in an argument with God, what? He always wins. 
And I don't mind arguing with him because that's who we are as human beings. He doesn't want pusillanimous Christians. All right? When God brings something tough into your life, you don't say, okay, that's fine, God. He brings something else. <laughs> My dad dies. It's okay, God. My wife dies. Yes, I praise the Lord. You bonehead. You're, God's bringing tough stuff into your life. Admit it. And it may come to a time where God brings something in your life and you just don't like it. Does he know you don't like it? So stop trying to fake him out. Right? God, I don't like this. I know. You're not God. I know. <laughs> See? So these people had a problem and God basically put an exclamation point where they put a question mark. God said, it's my world. And in the end, aren't we, God, aren't we glad that God has had his way completely and fully? Has God ever worked in your life that later on you didn't say that was good? See? God quiets unrest. Now let me just say this before I conclude. Unrest is coming to our church. Visitors are going, uh, I'm not coming back, <laughs> all right? Unrest is coming to our church. Why? It comes to every church. It's how you deal with it that's important. You get that? Why? Because we're human beings. And we don't know and understand everything that God has for us, and we may have disagreements. But what was the answer to the unrest? It said God quiets unrest and brings peace. You know how that happened? Prayer. When unrest happens in this church with one another, pray. If you got a problem with somebody, you know how to solve it? Pray for them. And then pray with them. Oh, you really like that, right? I got a problem with this guy. Go pray with him. I don't want to do that, all right? All right? Pray with him. You'll find it stops things because you're both before the cross, right? And it's all equal ground before the cross. True? So brothers and sisters, listen carefully to this. Prayer, according to our third pillar, believing firmly in the power of prayer. I got a good book for you to read, okay? <laughs> it's called Power Through Prayer by Ian e. Bounce. I gave that last week, he gave it this week. Get that book. Okay, I'll make, you, I'll make you a promise. If you can't buy it, we'll get it for you, okay? Beautiful lady. It's 99 cents on Kindle. Or 99 cents. Anybody in here tells me you don't got 99 cents, you're lying to me. All right? Okay. I'll give you 99 cents. Get that book, Power Through Prayer. Power Through Prayer. It will change your life. Second thing I've given it to you before, with Christ in the school of prayer. With Christ in the school of prayer. Get these books, guys. Get these books. These are books written by individuals who have been in the throes of prayer. Another one is read books about George Mueller, M-U-L-L-E-R, I think it's, or E-U-R. Mueller is how it's called, okay? George Mueller, all right? You can have it, George Mueller, Mueller of Bristol. That book is phenomenal. And if you've gotten all those, there's the last book is really, really good. Um, you can ask Beck about it. She has about three or four of them, all right? Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, okay, they said it. All right. When a humble, praising people tremble at God's word, God's presence is there. Write that down. When a humble, praising people who tremble at God's word, God's presence is there. God comes. Okay, what, what are the three prayers that I've asked you to pray in the morning? What's the first one? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Write these down under the morning prayers there. The moment you wake up and the moment you put your feet over the side of the bed, first prayer out of your mouth is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Second prayer, God, send me into the harvest today. God, send me into the harvest today. Uh, 
And the last one is, God, give unction to our pastor and keep him holy. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to make myself or important, but I agonize over the sermons. I do not want anything to come between you and the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So I'm asking you just to remember those three things. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, send me in the harvest today. And God, give unction to our pastor and keep him holy. Because I'm going to tell you something. Bullseye is on all of us. But the first one that goes down usually is the pastor when he wants to destroy the church. And I, I mean, that's just part of it. That's part of being in the ministry, okay? All right? When you pray, what happens? Let's go through the slides real quick and we'll be done. What's the first one? When we pray, what happens? God what? God draws men. What's the second one? He prepares people for the ministry. What's the third one? All right, God sends us into the harvest, all right? Number four, God, God reveals truth. Number five, God, God anoints preaching and witnessing. God anoints preaching and witnessing. Number six, God, God gives his presence. Seven, God transforms people. And the last one is God quiets unrest and gives peace. Let's pray.